Y'all ready for the word? I'm stalling y'all because it's a heavy word. And y'all, y'all may not like me. Somebody said it ain't that deep, but it is that deep though, y'all. All right, we might as well get started, right? <laughs> Exodus chapter 18, Exodus chapter 18. Man, Jeezy, it's your birthday yesterday, right? Y'all, it's Mandela's birthday. Or... How old? 38? He ain't 30. How old are you? Tell the true shame devil. 33. It's different. Are you single? Tech technically, technically. That's technically sounds like hope. That sounds like hope. That sounds like sounds like it's complicated. You know, you should have talked to me about this before church, saying we wouldn't be in this position right now. You, yeah, you probably should let me know. All right, well, Mandeli's 33 and he's technically single, so technically conduct yourselves accordingly. Exodus chapter 18. Woo. I'm having way too much fun. Let's read the Bible, y'all. Exodus chapter 18, verse 1, and it reads, And Jethro, and the other country name, Jethro, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah. I'm not supposed to typecast people, but with a name like Zipporah, Hmm. She was not one to be messed with. Moses' wife, after he had sent her back with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land, and the name of the other was Eleazar, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and we'll slow down here, here's the whole message, came with his sons and his what? wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. So Jethro came to meet Moses and he brought him his what? Wife and kids. Okay. That's awkward. Why wasn't his wife and kids with him? Hmm. And he said to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, are coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. It was his kids too. So Moses went out to meet his who? And bowed down and kissed. Y'all, y'all, y'all picking up what I'm dropping? He didn't even acknowledge her presence. Not a hello, not a kiss, not a how you been? They asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Every time we preach Moses, we preach it from the context of the amazing leader. We don't preach it from the context of the horrible husband. And Father, it's going to be a good day. Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful for your presence, for your grace, for the fact that you desire to take our burdens, our pressure, our pain, and exchange them with a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I'm praying that you'd guard our hearts and guard our minds in Christ Jesus, that you'd speak to us. Take us one step closer to the plan, the purpose, the destiny that you have for us. We'll be ever so careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, somebody say amen and amen and amen. We're in week two of a series called It's Not That, It's Not That Deep, and I feel like the series title is a lie because it is that deep. Relationships are what we're talking about, and they're not simple in the least bit. They're complicated. They're overwhelming. Sometimes they're full of joy, and sometimes they're the most difficult and discouraging things that we encounter in our lives. Why are we saying it's not that deep? Here's why. It's kind of like when they say this, how do you eat an elephant? Why are you eating an elephant? That's the first question. I just... 
I just don't think elephant's going to be that tasty. But if you're going to eat an elephant, you're going to eat it one bite at a time. Relationships may be complicated and overwhelmed. And here's what I find for a lot of people. Because it's so complicated and overwhelming, we just bury our head in the sand. I don't know where to start, so I'm just not going to start. I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do nothing. And the whole idea of this series is to give you just one thought, just one idea. Don't worry about fixing 17 things. Just worry about this one thing. And if you'll apply this one thing to your life, you will see forward progress. You'll see God moving in that area of your life. Last week, our one thought was, you're the problem. Come on, look at somebody next to you tell them you're the problem, you're the problem. Come on, you, you've been wanting, I wish I was sitting next to my wife right now, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm preaching messages, you could go home and just tell your spouse, you heard what he said, did you hear what, did you hear what he said? The, the one thought for this week is going to be a little less controversial, but it, it's going to be more heavy than you can imagine. The thought for today is we need to define love. Before we move any further, we've got to define love. One of the things that I realize is when somebody says love or I love you, not everybody means the same thing. When, when, when one person says I love you, what, what, what they're really saying is I love the way you make me. Oh, I love you. I love the way you make me feel. You, you encourage me, you build me up, you make me feel special, you, you make me feel invincible. I want you to stay around all the time because I like the way you make me. And they're saying I love you, but really what they mean is you're making me feel awesome. Other people, when they say I love you, they're saying I want to do everything I can to make you happy. Will you do everything you can to make me happy? And as long as we're making each other happy, I love you. I do for you. You do for me. We're in love. Then there's some people that when they say I love you, what they mean is, I'm not talking about a feeling, I'm not even talking about an action, I've made a decision that I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life, till death do us part. It's not based on how you make me feel, and it's not based on what you do for me. I've made a decision. I'm committed to you. I love you. Today's message is entitled Covenants, Contracts, and Convenience. I'm having fun. Are you having fun? Now, before we get into this message, let me, let me give you some ground rules, just some ground rules, okay? Because you, you get into a message like this and some of you get hurt. So let me, let me explain, okay? There's, there's pretty much two rules, okay? You ready for the first rule? First rule is no elbows. And you know what I'm talking about. Come on, look at the person who say he's preaching to you. Come on, tell somebody he's, he's preaching to you. He's, so just leave me out of it, Okay. Come on, husbands, no. <laughs> Babe, did you write that down? Did you write that down? That, that was for you. This is none, none of that. None of that. Let the Holy Spirit do all the elbowing. You just, come on, look straight ahead. And well, the married folks, let me just help you out. Just don't say amen at the wrong point today. Don't, don't. I will not be offended if you don't say amen for the whole message. Because one wrong amen can cost you a long week. So you just, I don't know who he's talking about. It got nothing to do with me. Y'all ready for rule number two? This is entire message is about your future, and it's not about your past. And that's a big one. Your past is redeemed. Your past is forgiven. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have been made new. Why do I say that? Because whenever we hear about what God's best is for us, the enemy instantly wants to remind us about the mistakes that we made and the things that we did that was not God's past. And here, I heard one preacher say, every time the enemy tries to remind you of your past, remind him of his future. <laughs> which is an eternity in the lake of fire separated from all of humanity. God has forgiven and redeemed your past. We all have a past. There's all parts of our past that we're not proud of. 
Let's not worry about that because that's forgiven. We're talking about the future that God has for us. Somebody say amen. amen. Here we go. There are three types of love that people have in a marriage. We're talking about marriage specifically today, but in any type of relationship, there's three types of love. But hear me, only one type of love, watch this, is endorsed by God and is actually going to build the marriage that God has for you. And watch this, that you will actually enjoy. Because since I'm warmed up, this ain't my first service. I'm already warmed up. Can I just go there? The other two types of love, you won't even enjoy it. It's not about this is what God has for you, but you want something there. There's only one type of love that will actually bring you the type of relationship that will bring lasting fulfillment and lasting joy and lasting covenant. The first type of love is what I call convenience love. I love you because of how you make me feel. And as long as you make me feel this way, I'll be committed to you. But the second I don't feel this way any longer, all bets are... Oh, the second type of love is what I call contractual love. I do for you, you do for me. The second you stop doing for me, I am no longer obligated to do for... Come on now. You ever had a friend's birthday come around? Your spouse asks you, are you getting them a gift? And you start to think, well, did they get me one? Am I the only petty, shady person on planet Earth? They did get me a gift, but now I got to figure out how much it costs. (laughs) If you get me a $50 Starbucks gift card for my birthday, guess what you get? $35 Amazon (laughs) gift card. (laughs) That's contractual. I'll do for you, you'll do for me. Covenant love is it's not about what you do. And it's not about how I feel. It's the fact that I am committed to you. And here's the problem. We live in a convenience and a contractual world. Everything today is how convenient, how fast can you get me my food? How many days can I work from home? Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Watch it now. Come on now. What's in it for me? Most of our lives are based on convenience and the stuff that's not convenient. Have you ever actually read a contract? Some of y'all are like, no, that's why I'm in the trouble I'm in right now. Should have read it. <laughs> Contracts don't say anything about what I'm going to do for you or what you're going to do for me. It's all about if you don't keep up your end of the bargain, what I get to do to you. You, you, you read it? Try stop making that payment. I'll take your house and I'll ruin your credit. Oh, if you don't fulfill that, I'm going to put a lien on this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's all about what repercussions I can take from you when you fail on your end of the... And here's the wild thing. Most dating relationships start with chemistry. Convenience. I like the way you make me... And then after I like the way you make me feel, I'm watching to see what you're going to do for... We going Dutch? Are you going to pay the bill? Am I going to pay the bill? Am I going to get a little T-Rex arms? Oh, I'm sorry. I tried to, <laughs> tried to grab the check. I could, you move so fast. I, oh, wow. You had no intentions of grabbing that bill. That's why you ordered a main entree and one to take home too. But that's the different convert. We're used to this contract. And then all of a sudden, God says, no, 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 covenant is the only thing that a healthy marriage can be built on and that will thrive. You see, when you sign a contract, you have to use a pen. If it's a contract with big numbers, they'll make you use a blue pen. Apparently black pens, you can photocopy and you can forge. And, no, I need you to use a blue pen. And if it's a massive contract, and I've signed one of these contracts, before, you've got to get a witness to sign. So you sign and then the witness says, I've seen them sign. That's how you make a contract legal. But a biblical covenant, God says, no, no, no. I don't need it signed in pen. I need it signed in blood. 
So back in the day when two people would make a covenant, or two nations, I'm going to protect you, you're going to protect me, or whatever it may be, the two kings would get together and they would bring this covenant sacrifice. By the way, it really stinks to be a covenant lamb. You're just showing up to this agreement. You don't know what the negotiations are about. And man, this is... <laughs> Next thing you know, you see these two people shake hands, and then an axe comes out. Woof! <laughs> Poor little sheep. This is a little too graphic, right? And then here's what the two kings would do. They would walk through the center of the animal that was cut, and the blood would get all on their feet. And there was a signification of, watch this, we're family now. This is bonded by blood. This is the same thing as if we were born from the same mother. This is for life. Come on now. Nowadays, when you get married, you kind of say your I do's, and then you go in the back office, and the pastor has a little certificate, and you sign, and he signs, and now it's legal. You know what weddings were like back in the Jewish days? They don't do this today, but, but back in the day, they would take an animal, and they would dice it up. This was part of the ceremony. And, and, and you and your spouse and your Michael Kors, y'all would walk. <laughs> Bet y'all wouldn't be wearing white shoes that day. You would walk through the dismembered parts of that sacrifice, saying these words, let it be unto us as it was to this animal if we break our covenant. We ought to start doing that again. We ought to... We ought to start. No, it's, it's blood. God says, here's the only type of love that a marriage can be built on. When the level of commitment is I'm committed to you like you are family. Because a lot of us don't even, can't even comprehend that type of commitment. Watch this. We're more committed to our children than we are to our spouse. And, and we say stuff like, well, blood is thicker than water. Well, according to God, it is blood. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man God says, okay, let's start here. If you're going to build the marriage that I have for you, and I'm going to tell you how to build it, but if you're going to build it, it has to start from the place of this is blood. This, this is until death do us part. Not, not, not to get super graphic, but, but that's why God designed on the honeymoon night that there would be blood. Because from day one, he said, no, this is a contract that should never be broken because it wasn't signed in pen. It was signed in but here's the thing. We live in a society that, 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 that nobody showed us this. Nobody taught us this. I, I never saw my parents live in covenant. I never even seen them live together. They just kind of did their own thing. And, the, and I was told that nobody will look out for me. I've got to look out for myself. And, and if I don't feel it, then I don't have to do it. And, and next thing you know, I made a covenant on prom night. We're going to have a good day today. We're going to laugh in a second, but we just... And then I made another covenant freshman year and one more junior year and then on that new job. And then I stand in front of this person and I say, till death do us part. And I'm trying to make a covenant, but I don't even honor covenant. This is getting heavy, right? Let's go back to the Bible. Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. There's this guy by the name of Moses. Somebody say Moses. Yeah, you ever heard of Moses. Moses was the guy that God said, I'm going to make you the deliverer of Israel. Israel, over three million people at the time were in slavery in Egypt. They were crying out to God and God sent Moses. He said, I'm going to use you to set my people free. At the time, Moses was living out in the desert in Midian because he had to run from his life, different story for a different day. He ran into a shepherd by the name of Jethro. Moses said, Jethro, I'm unemployed. Do you mind if I work for you? He said, yeah, you can take care of my sheep. And, and Moses was taking care of his sheep. And he had this co-worker named Zipporah. And I'm telling you, homegirl was bad. 
I mean, them Hebrew girls back in Egypt were whatever, but Zipporah, I mean, it was just like, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And then it turned out that Zipporah was the boss's daughter. Moses said, I hit the jackpot, and he ends up marrying Zipporah. They have two sons, Gershom and Eleazar, and Moses runs into the burning bush. God speaks to Moses and said, I'm calling you to be a deliverer to the nation. Moses goes to Zipporah, says, you can now call me deliverer, Moses, because I have a call of God on my life. A lot of people know Moses in the 10 plagues. They know Moses part in the Red Sea. A lot of people don't know that Moses was separated from his wife. See, what happened on the way to Egypt to be this deliverer, Moses and Zipporah got into an argument. The argument got so heated that Moses sent her back with her father. A lot of people don't know this, but that when Moses was calling down frogs and rain and all this other kind of stuff in Egypt, his kids and his wife never saw it because they weren't there. When Moses grabbed that staff and stretched it over the Red Sea and the waters parted and an entire nation walked through on dry ground, then the Egyptians came after them and God closed the water over. When Moses had the greatest moments of his life, His wife was not there to witness it, and their kids never saw it because their marriage wasn't wasn't working. Here's why. It tells us in Exodus chapter 4, verse 24, what the argument was about. (laughs) It came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Y'all, I love God's word. It's just wild. Chapter 3, God comes to Moses and said, I'm going to use you in a great way. It don't take him but till chapter 4. Golly, God, maybe you could try to kill him in chapter 6. No, one chapter over. I'm going to kill this man. (laughs) Can I preach it for a second? Because she is a daughter of God. Some of his fathers, we just want to kill a dude over our daughter. (laughs) God feels the same way. He said that God met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, surely, watch the words, you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Let me explain what just happened. God came to Moses and he said, Moses, I'm sending you to Israel. To, to li- they are my people. I am making a covenant with Israel that I belong to them. But in order for any covenant to be made, there has to be the shedding of blood. Tell Israel they must be circumcised. And that's going to be a symbol that I am covenantly committed to them for the rest of their life. So Moses wakes up and he goes to Israel to teach them that they're in covenant with God. Watch this. But he wasn't in covenant with his own family. God says, Moses, you're out of order. I'm going to kill you. I mean, can we talk about this? <laughs> can, I, can I get this? Because Moses, you're more committed to your calling than you are to your family. You'd bleed for your job. You'd bleed for a raise, but not for your spouse. God says, Moses, that is out of order. We're going to talk about building a great marriage and all this other good stuff, but it starts with this, that that my commitment to you is is covenant, and it's until death. Next week's message is on murder, but today we're going to talk about... (laughs) Three thoughts, three thoughts. Let me give you this. Just three quick thoughts. The first one is this. You can build on covenant. You can build on covenant covenant. You you, you ever heard that phrase, the grass is greener where you water it? You've heard that, right? The grass isn't green on the other side. If your neighbor has green grass, it's because they they water it, they fertilize it, they they seed it. If you want green grass, you've got to water it and fertilize it and seed it. The grass. If you see someone with an amazing marriage, now hear me, there's a difference between an amazing marriage and an Instagram marriage. 
clarify. Talking about hashtag goals. Anything you can put a hashtag on ain't real. You, you do know that, right? That's 2023. I don't know what people know nowadays. It's like, oh, oh my God, they went to Bora Bora. That is amazing. Do you know they fought like cats and dogs the entire flight, and they only agreed enough to take that one picture to post it? I'm not talking about Instagram, man. I'm talking about a real, any marriage that is amazing, hear me, that couple put in work. It didn't just happen. Can I help you out? It's not because they married their soulmate. I found my soulmate. Somebody who understands me. (laughs) Nobody understands you. It's not. (laughs) They, can I get some married folks to say a. They put work in. Any great marriage was built. It was not found. Can, 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 can I give you some things that you, you need to build in, in, in your marriage? And I get, I get frustrated. Because I run into so many people, and me and my wife were in the same position where, where, where you leave your house and you get set out to, to start adulting. And nobody taught you how to budget or pay off debt. I don't know, a Roth IRA from a SEP, from a what in the... I'm fig- nobody taught us how to manage our money. It's just figured out. You know what they also didn't tell us? How to build a marriage. It was kind of like, just find somebody you love and hope it works. Probably shouldn't say this, but I always say a bunch of stuff that I shouldn't say. Me and my wife, we were in premarital counseling before we got married. And, and our premarital counseling was something like this. Who's going to do the irony? <laughs> then she ironed one of my shirts. I'm like, I got this. I got this. this thing. <laughs> Who's going to cook? Who's going to take the trash out? Who's going to do the... It, it was like a chores list. It didn't teach us how to build. Can, can I give you some stuff that you're going to have to... Build? It doesn't just happen. You've got to build it in your marriage. By the way, our marriage night is coming up on March 10th. It is live online. It's going to be a blast. We're going to die laughing. We have fun that they're not allowed to have fun at singles night. I'm just telling you, don't miss marriage night. Anyway, can I give you some stuff to build? Here's some stuff. that You've got to build your communication. I wish somebody had told me that. Do you know just because you're talking doesn't mean you're communicating? I wish somebody had told me that when I had two children and one had just pooped all the way up his back and the other one was running around naked and I asked my wife, babe, can I go play golf with the fellas? And she said, sure, babe, go. Why are you laughing? She said, sure, babe, go. Okay, I'm going to help some of these men out. Women, why do y'all do that? Why don't you just say what you mean? She said, what? She said, sure, babe, go. I don't have the gift of interpretation. I did not know that sure, babe, go really meant I dare you. So she said, sure, babe, go, and I... And I had the best round of golf I've ever had in my life. And then I walk in the house all happy and chipper, trying to tell her about my 300-yard drive, and communication had ceased. But babe, how's it going? Silence. How's the kids? Silence. You okay? No words. What did I do? You know. What does this mean? (laughs) Now I got to learn Morse code. It's like... (laughs) You've got to learn how to communicate. You know, they they say the average woman uses 30,000 words every day. A lot of talking. The average man uses 15,000 or less a day. What would happen early on me and my marriage with with Pastor Zai, I I would use my 15,000 words up at work. And she would save her 30,000 words for when I got home. I come home and she said, how's your day go? Oh, that bad? You want something to eat? And she's like, let me tell you about my day. 
We had to learn how to come. I've, I've learned some things. We're celebrating 10 years of marriage coming up in August. It's the best seven years of her life. I tell you, I tell you, it was. I'm not a vet like you 30, 40 year old marriage folks, but, but we've learned some things. Man, let me teach you some stuff, man. I've learned some stuff. I've learned some stuff. This will make you have the best night you've ever had in your life. Here's what you got to say to her. She'll, she'll talk, she'll talk. And here's what you need to say. And then what happened? <laughs> Listen. That's the moneymaker right there. You use that phrase? Or go on. <laughs> you, you've got to, sounds patronizing, huh? It is. You've got to learn to come. Communicate. You've got to learn unity. Can, can I tell you a lie that preachers say all the time? We say it at a wedding. And the two have become one. And I'll present to you Mr. and Mrs. Whoever, whoever, whoever. Biblically, you're one. Spiritually, you're one. Friday night when you're trying to pick a restaurant, you is too. <laughs> Babe, where do you want to eat? I want steak. Well, I want sushi. Well, you're wrong. You've got to learn yeah. unity. Yeah. And, and here's what happens in so many young marriages, and me and my wife were there. When you, you, you get irritated by their differences. Why couldn't you just be more like me? You don't like the right food. You don't watch the right movies. You're not angry at the same people I'm angry at. Like, if I hate them, you're supposed to hate them. What are you doing? And here's what we don't realize. If your spouse was your clone, one of you would be unnecessary. Why we got both of us when we think the same, talk the same, and look at the world the same? No, I need somebody that balances me out because if you don't balance me out, I'm going to be an extreme, and any good thing taken to an extreme is destructive. I need somebody who sees the world differently so they can... But it takes you a while to learn they're not your enemy. They're your co-pilot. They're your teammate. They're, they're the person that God has sent. That you, you know the Bible says anything that you agree on here on earth will be done on heaven. You need somebody to agree with so that God can do what he wants to do. We've got to learn to build romance. Y'all know that's something you build, right? They don't, they don't tell you that before you get married because you're just like, I've been waiting for this day. my own life. <laughs> realize this. You know, women, y'all spend your whole lives dreaming about that wedding day. So do us men. We just dreaming about a different part of the day. So I was like, babe, what do you think about these flowers for the wedding? I'm like, uh. what do you want to wear? Clothes. Where do you want to go for the honeymoon? I do have an opinion on that. I mean, let me tell you, I had all, and, and, and we think, man, yeah. Except as life goes on, you realize that nighttime is not the only romance time. And if you don't know how to be romantic before that, I travel a lot. I, I'll go preach at different churches or whatever it may be. And, and my wife started doing this thing where, where, where she would write a note and she'd stick it in my suitcase. And I wouldn't know that she would do it. And I'd get to the hotel or whatever it may be. And I'm opening my bag or opening my Bible or whatever it may be. And this note just... And I pick my note up and I... What did the note say? Mind your business. I put the note down. I pick up the phone. Am I calling my wife? Nope. I'm calling my assistant. Hey, can you get me an earlier flight home? I need to get out of here. Why do you need? You just got there. I know, but I've got a reason to come home. Can you? My wife's there. When I get, don't worry about what she said. I just need to get me home. You've got to learn to build romance. Can I give you one last one? You've got to build your faith together. This is one of the things that I thought about. Should I say this? Because it might be a little bit too honest, but hey, I think it'll help you out. Sometimes I lose faith. Not faith in Jesus. I've never lost my faith in Jesus, but I've lost my faith at times for a miracle that I was believing God for. 
This natural situation has not changed for so long. I've just started to accept it and not believe that God can change. I can't tell you how many times in our marriage I've lost faith for something. And my wife has said, you may not be able to believe God for it, but I've got enough. I've got you, babe. I'm going to believe God that this will come to pass. Then there's times where her faith gets exhausted. I'm like, babe, you may not be able to believe in this season, but I'm believing for you. God is going to bring it to pass. You've got to learn to build your faith faith together, but I can't build on convenience and I can't build here. Here's what happens when I try to build communication on convenience. I will only talk to you and build when I feel like it and it will never be a priority because it has to be based on my feelings. And by the way, you will never feel like building. When my relationship is based on convenience, I will say reckless things out of my mouth because I don't intend on being here for the ramifications. Come on now. Can I say something? Wow. Listen, you fight different when it's covenant. Two things happen when it's covenant. First of all, you don't say something that you're not going to have to deal with 30 years from now. Because this is forever. And the second thing is, when you realize they can't leave, let me tell you what I really wanted to tell you. And another thing. And your mom. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm getting in trouble. That's all right. I'm going to help you out. You think because you live together, you have covenant. And you're like, Pastor, we love each other. It's working. We got kids together. All. Can I be honest with you? You have not started to build yet. Because until I can trust that you'll be here for 50 years, I'm not really going to tell you what I'm thinking. And I'm not going to share the deepest parts of my faith with you. Because I don't know if you're going to leave like the last person did. Come on now. We, we, we think that God is this stiff, uptight, doesn't want us to have any fun because that's why he just has all these rules. God says, no, I, I want to get you to build this thing as early as you possibly can. And if you delay building, doing it your way, it takes longer and it creates more pain. Second thing is this, write this down, write this down. Covenant is here for the process. Covenant is here for, uh, this, this, this is one of them transparent messages where I get in trouble, but, but my wife ain't going to kill me, so I'll be all right. Um, I said this first service, there was this big gasp, but my wife is the same way. So I don't remember my wedding vows. I have no idea what we said. Neither does she, though. It, it was all a blur. She got there late. I got there late. We lost the ring bearer. It was just, it was a lot. It was a lot. It was a lot. All I do remember, my dad did the wedding. All I remember is he said naked and unashamed 17 times in his message. He's like, and they were naked. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. I'm sitting there like, dad, golly, what is... Never let your dad do your wedding. It was amazing. No, it was great. Thanks, dad. He's actually watching. It was great. But it was, I, just, I, don't, I don't remember... Wedding vows. You ever heard people say, I didn't sign up to be this miserable? That's a statement of convenience. It's not a statement of covenant. Because actually you did sign up to be this miserable. Because I couldn't remember my vows, I went back and I looked them up. You know what they tricked me into saying? They said, say this. I said, why? They said, because you can't have a honeymoon until you do. I said, okay. <laughs> they had me say stuff like, for better or for worse. For richer or for unemployed. In sickness or in health. And what happens is, because you're in love... You just say whatever they tell you to say. Yes, sir. All my worldly wealth I give to thee. <laughs> but then you tripping over joint accounts. 
I'm, I'm going back there. I'm going back. I haven't forgiven you yet. I'm going back there. No, seriously. You signed up for worse, for poor, for sickness. That's covenant. Convenience does not acknowledge the fact that my spouse is going to have rough seasons of life because we live in a fallen world where the enemy attacks and there's real sickness and there's real cutbacks and there's real family drama and all that other good stuff. And here's what happens when I'm here for convenience, not covenant, and life is kicking you in the way that you can no longer make me feel good for this season. I'm offended. I'm upset. How dare you be sick this long? And we wouldn't say it with our mouths because that sounds so immature, but our actions are, you lost your job? What kind of man are you? Are you tearing down your future? Because let me just help you out. That's the last thing he needs right now. What he needs is it's me and you forever. There's seasons you're going to carry me, and there's seasons I'm going to carry you. That's what covenant is. This ain't convenience. This ain't a contract. This is until death do us part. So when the love is convenience, I get offended when you're not at your best. When the love is contractual and you're no longer able to meet my needs, I'll go meet them myself somewhere else because my commitment was only based on what you can do for when it's covenant, it's like, okay, here we go. It's my turn. Yeah. Throw that chicken noodle soup in the microwave because I can't cook, but I got you. <laughs> Come here, Jay, girl. I don't know how to do hair, but we're going to figure this thing out. And just, <laughs> mommy ain't feeling well, so out the door. <laughs> Zoe looking at me like, Daddy, don't make me go out looking like this, Daddy. I, like, Daddies do hair too. Not well, but because it's covenant. Come on now. Do you know how safe it is to not be okay when you know your spouse ain't going nowhere? Can I, can I talk the other side of the coin real quick? Some of you, you're not okay. You're ignoring, ignoring your physical health. You've slipped into depression because of that last setback, that last job loss. And that's convenience. You, you owe it because of your covenant to your spouse to be the best version of you and to embrace whatever journey is ahead to get there. Yes, they have covenant. They're going to carry you. But there's going to be a season where you've got to carry them. I've I, I been praying over this message for a while because I just know, it, it, Pastor, I want that. I want covenant, but I'm married to somebody who, who they're not in a covenant space. They never saw covenant in their parents. They never applied. They, they don't. Can I say something? I'm not. Be, this is, you need a miracle. But here's the great part. I know the miracle worker. If you're in need of a miracle. You've come to the right place because this is a place where miracles. God says, I'm the God that takes the hearts of stone and I'm able to turn them back into flesh. If you need a miracle, there is a miracle working God that can do a miracle in your marriage. But hear me. He can't do a miracle if you refuse to do it his way. I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm getting real strong. We'll laugh in a second. We won't. <laughs> but we just did. Anyway, if you're immature enough to say, I won't do it until they do it, I'll be covenant when they're covenant. No, you're the child of God. So they are too. That's none of your business. You say, I'm going to love the way that God's called me to love, and I'm going to allow him to do the miracle that I need to do, and I'm not going to worry about what they're doing because what they're doing is none of my business. The, the word promise, the word promise. We're going, Sean, come play. We're going to land this plane. Let me give you the word promise. I'll give you point number three. We're going to wrap this up in a nice pretty bow and go home and watch the Eagles win the Super Bowl. Okay, here we go. 
out of the mouth of the prophet, he has ordained praise. Anyway, the word promise, somebody say promise. That's what you do at the altar when you're getting married. I, I promise. I, you, you, you promise. The word promise in Latin. Now, I didn't take Latin in college, so if I don't pronounce it correctly, you did. Don't come up to me in the lobby afterwards. I want to hear your mouth. Anyway, promise is somewhere close to prometeer. Prometeer. The word pro means forward. The word mater means send. Here's what a promise is. I'm going to send forward my commitment to you. What does that mean? Do you know that the day you're getting married, unless you're getting pressured into it or whatever, the day you're getting married, you don't need those vows. Because this is the day that I love you and it's forever. Why am I giving you these vows? Because there's going to be a day where I ain't really feeling you. Oh, your mama. There's going to be a day where marriage is not convenient and you're not keeping up your end of the contract. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my promise to that day. Hear me on the day that I'm not feeling it on the day that I don't think you did for me. So I don't have to do for on that day. I'm promising to love and hold to protect and always trust and always persevere. I'm sending my promise. The only reason a promise is needed is for the day you're not feeling it. What you're saying is when I'm not feeling it, you don't have to worry about my feelings. I'm still committed. Last thing is, write this down, write this down. Covenant remains, vision develops. Covenant remains, vision develops. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 says this. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end. And it will speak and it will not lie, though it tarries. Somebody say, wait for it. Wait for it. Because it will surely come. I will not tarry. Okay, so here's what happened. Moses went to the Midian singles night. And he did a little speed dating that they had set up. I didn't know church folks speed date, but they did it singles night. So Moses did a little speed dating. This little chick Zipporah came across and Zipporah said, what's what's your plan for your life? And Moses said, well, I'm a deliverer. Ooh, that sounds good. What does it pay? <laughs> I ain't got that quite far with my employer, but I'm sure the pay is good. I got benefits, and it's good. And, and he's, I'm going to go to Egypt. I'm going to lead three million people into this promise land. It's flowing with milk and honey. You want to come? The poor said, yeah, yeah, I want to come. <laughs> you know what Moses told Zipporah? Everything he knew. But he didn't know the whole story. Because when God said you're a deliverer, he left out the ten plagues. Why, why did he? When God said you're the deliverer, he didn't say the Egyptians were going to try to come and take you back and you would have to part a Red Sea. And he definitely didn't know that after they got through the Red Sea, that there would be snakes biting them and enemies attacking them and hailstorms and whole. Oh, he didn't know the whole story. He just knew what God told him. And if Zipporah was in covenant with the vision and not covenant with him, and the vision changed. And she's like, this isn't what I signed up for. And you know what Moses would say? Me either. I didn't sign up for unemployment. I didn't sign up for cancer. I didn't sign up to go to a different city. I didn't, I didn't know that this was where we were going. God didn't tell me this. Watch this. When our love is convenient and the vision changes, I get offended. You tricked me. You're, drag, you're taking advantage. When love is contractual and the vision changes, I say, cool, I'm just going to create my own vision. You do you, I do me. We'll meet at the kids. But if you got a vision and I got a vision, we got two visions, which means there is division. And then we wonder why we divide. Covenant love, when vision changes, says, okay, I didn't sign up for this, but I signed up for you. Where are we going? What are we doing? What role am I playing? Because I didn't sign up for where we were going. I signed up for you. And I'm here till death do us part. All that preaching to get to this point. Are you ready? You ready? It is humanly impossible to love another human that way. 
That's pretty discouraging. Tell me this whole message about what I'm supposed to do. Now I can't do it. No, you can't do it. Because you can't give something that you've never received. I didn't see it in my parents. None of my friendships are like that. I've never seen. You've got to see it before you can do it. That's why God says, I'm going to show it to you so that you're able to do it for others. Luke chapter 22, verse 20 says this. Likewise, Jesus also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new. Don't worry about other people's commitments to you that they didn't keep their word. Don't worry about the other people in your life that, 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 that taught you to walk away because they walked away from you. God says, I'm going to show you what it's like for somebody to never walk away. He said, this is a new cup, and I'm going to do this one in blood, which is shed for you. Here, here's what the Bible says. We love others because Christ first loved. Until you've received the covenant love of Jesus Christ in your life, it is impossible to love somebody else that way. But when, and, and you know what, folks, there's so many Christians that are not in covenant love with God. Because every other love in your love life was contractional, you've brought a contractional relationship to Jesus. So you're performing for him and you're trying to live holy for him and you're tithing because you think if you give God money, he will love you more and you don't realize the type of love that God gives. God says when you are in your least lovable state, while you were yet sinners, I shed my blood for a covenant commitment with you. So before we think anything about marriage, here's my prayer for you that you would experience the overwhelming love of Jesus in your life. And from that place of I've never been so loved in my life, you'll have the power to love others. Ephesians 3.17 says this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul said, I'm praying this over the whole church. I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Not in convenience, not in contracts, in Love may have power together with all the Lord. Can I just we're gonna end in a second? This type of power is only available to believers. I don't understand why, as the church, we're constantly judging unbelievers for their relationships and their marriages. They never had the power to make it work because that power is only available to a believer. Stop looking down on your parents, they didn't have the power. <laughs> They may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and how deep is the love of Christ. And I want you to know this love that surpasses your intellectual ability that you may be. He said, I want you to be filled with this type of love to the measure of all the fullness of God. Watch this. Now to him who is able, you may not be able, but he is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according not to your power, according to his power that is at work with in us good news bad news you don't have the ability to love someone to the level that would keep a marriage together the good news is God does some of us just for a season we've got to stop trying to fix our marriage and just receive God's love maybe for the first time in our lives and then from that place Watch him bring this back together. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. God, we are thankful. God, that you're not so cruel that you gave us a mandate that we couldn't do in our own strength. But you said in your word that you've given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. I pray over every single person in the sound of my voice, God, that we would have a tangible experience, God, with your love. Just be right with your eyes closed and your head bowed. If you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And just allow God to make this time, this moment personal to you. I have a simple question for you. Are you in covenant love with Jesus Christ? He made the offer. He shed his blood for you to show his commitment to you. 
But is your commitment to Jesus based on convenience, contract, or till death do us part? Because it's only until death do us part that's a real relationship with Jesus. So today I want to ask, do you have a real relationship with Jesus? Not, not with the church, not do you believe in God. Are you in relationship with him? And if you're not, here's your moment. Because it's not a feeling. It's not an action. It's a decision. Say, Pastor, I'm ready to make that decision. Pray this prayer with me. Maybe you've prayed it 29 times. But this is the first time you're making a decision. This is not going to be based on how I feel. This is my commitment for life. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me when I wasn't even thinking about you. Thank you for shedding your blood on the cross for my sin, for my mistakes to be erased. Right now, for the rest of my life, I invite you into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And use me. Don't say amen. Don't cut it. Father God, I pray over every single person. God, that we would have a tangible encounter with your love. The love that surpasses our ability to comprehend. God, that you would fill us with your commitment to us. God, from there, I pray that you would bring a commitment in our marriages that is literally supernatural. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Come on. Can you celebrate for everything that God is doing?